Business Model Canvas, prepared for and presented at the 2014 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. By show of hands, how many people are familiar with what the Business Model Canvas is? If you could raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up for just a sec. All right, so good, so about a fourth of you. So for those of you that you know, aren't familiar, you got some colleagues in the space that hopefully are also in your track that uh, you, can, you can bounce ideas off of. Uh, for, you that, for those of you that um, real, know what this is, well, this will be a bit of a review for you, but hopefully a, a, you'll learn a couple extra things and why we're doing this. And this is sort of one of your deliverables as we go through this program. So uh, hopefully it sets the stage and you can understand how to do this and the rationale behind it and it helps, uh, it helps grow your business idea. Um, so I, I wanted to throw this slide up there briefly to start with because uh, as ML mentioned, I'm part of I-10 or the IT Entrepreneur Network. And um, this is just a value delivery slide and a company progress slide that we put together. It has uh, a lot of our programming and things down there. And I threw it up there as just kind of a point of reference because when we talk about the, uh, the business model canvas or understanding your business model, it, 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 for us, it really happens pretty early on in the process. This, these sort of accordion slides here are sort of your, your product development arc in a very loose sense. And you know, these happen to be some of our business development programs. BMV is our business model validation program. So we situate you know, understanding your business model and doing a business model canvas pretty early, which is why we're kicking off this program, looking at it early on. And you'll notice in terms of the product development arc, you know, it really comes fairly early before you really get to the, the investors. We've talked about investors, we talked about asking for money. If you haven't sort of proved out your model, it's going to be real challenging to get investors to get interested in what you're doing. So um, that's why we kind of talk about this and why we think it's pretty important. In, uh, particularly in the tech space, you hear a lot about, uh, you know, a lot of people badmouth business plans, and I know a business plan is one of the deliverables here, and a lot of people put it, you know, kind of a dichotomy between a business model or a business model canvas and a business plan. Which do you do? And, you know, we don't really see it technically at I-10 as an either or. Um, we actually, you know, you will probably be required to do a business plan at some point. Many investors will want you to do, will want to see one. Um, uh, banks, you know, if you go after debt financing, will want to see one. Um, what we see is that the business models really help generate your business plan. So if you do the model first and you understand that, uh, you can actually make a better and more authentic business plan um, for your business. Um, because a business plan's main role is really, it's just to sort of plan and outline. It's a planning document to communicate a business project. Um, so you could use it internally for your team, it gives your vision, but it is sort of a snapshot in time. And uh, I have yet to meet anyone who truthfully says they love to read business plans. Uh, you might hear that, uh, I think they're lying. Um, you know, at I-10, when companies come to us at the concept stage and want to lay a business plan on us, we're, we just kind of tell them, we're not going to read that right now because until you've shown us that you've worked through this model and this asset and understood that, this business plan is probably not going to have a lot of relevance to how you're going to engage your customers and actually deliver value. Um, a business model is much more agile than a business plan and we'll show, I'll sort of go into that detail in just a second. So that's sort of the reasons why we want to, we want to do it and, and introduce the topic to you now. So what is a business model? Um, it helps to have a core definition of these things going forward, and this is a pretty good one. It's directly from uh, um, uh, the business model generation book by Alex Osterwalder, who says that a business model describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Um, there are nine basic building blocks to a business model canvas. We'll look at those in a little bit detail. But it really shows the logic of how the company intends to make money. And that's kind of it's pretty important as you get, you know, decide to grow your business. Um, and it has sort of four main areas. You have the, the customers, the offer, the infrastructure of your business, and, you know, the financial viability of the business. And it takes all those into account. 
What you'll find in a business model canvas are many of the same pieces of information you might have in your business plan as you write it, but it's, it's much more dynamic. You see how they all interrelate and you see how they, um, they come together to paint a more holistic picture of what, how your business plans to deliver value. So like any good entrepreneur, um, you beg, borrow, and steal from people smarter than you, and you stand on the shoulders of others. And uh, a lot of this presentation is influenced by a couple books that you guys might want to think about looking at. Um, the one on the left, we're going to borrow heavily from the business model generation by a gentleman by the name of Alex Osterwalder that's kind of become the Bible of doing business model canvases. There's different versions of that. There's, one, there's some that have been more tailored to tech companies. Uh, some more for consumer products, but it's all kind of based off of the same kernel of, of what Alex Osterwalder puts together in that book, Business Model Generation. It's a very easy to read, uh, interactive type, type book. You can get it and, uh, and take a look at it if you go to businessmodelgeneration.com. Steve Blank is another uh, thought leader in the entrepreneurship space. He's a, a serial entrepreneur and somebody that teaches entrepreneurship at Stanford. Um, he has a book, Four Steps to the Epiphany. He's got several, actually. And his, his website at steveblank.com, uh, there's tremendously good blog posts, really easy to follow slides, uh, PowerPoint presentations on when you're building an early stage company, what you need to do. So I recommend these highly as uh, some, some resources you may want to look into outside of the class materials. Both of them sort of operate under these sort of five main tenets uh, around when you're starting a business at the early stage and looking at your business model. And the reason why we look at this prior to a business plan. No business plan really survives the first customer contact. So when you write a business plan, it's really giving yourself the rationale for the business. And when you go and you put, a, put your product or service in front of a customer, you're going to learn a lot. Uh, customers are unpredictable and they can really come back and look at things in a different way. So if you don't really know your customer intimately and understand exactly what you need to deliver, a business plan and a, and a large document probably isn't going to serve you very well when you're directly in front of them trying to, trying to close a sale or trying to, trying to sell what, you're, what you've developed. So we focus on the model. Um, you want to think through as many alternatives as possible. This is actually kind of the fun part of it, in my opinion. Um, you don't want to be rigidly stuck to sort of one way of doing things. There are multiple different business models for the same sort of business idea. And you want to be able to explore those and figure out how to do those and get to the heart of what really is going to work for your business. So you, you want to think through as many alternative possibilities as you can and be agile in your thinking about this. The other thing to remember is your model, when you get it down on, a, on paper, and we'll look at this in a second, is really just a set of guesses or hypotheses about these different aspects or elements of your business. Writing the, the different core elements down of your business model is half the battle. The second part is really going out and trying to validate that with the customers that you're going after or the market you're trying to serve. Question? Uh, what about parallel business models? Yeah, so you want to go into any more detail about that? trying to serve like different markets at right, the same exactly. time. Yeah, that's challenging. <laughs> that's something that you know investors have. The question, if you couldn't hear it, was parallel uh, uh, business models going on at the same time. So maybe you're trying to develop a platform where you're trying to serve a customer base, but you're also trying to, you need, you need both sides of a transaction to sort of build up your customer base. That, that's an that's a interesting way to go about it. What, what I would challenge you to do is figure out which one can you build first? And does that tip the scales one way or the other? Because trying to do both is really challenging, unless you have direct access to both of those bases, and you can really get good feedback. And we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. I don't know if that, that helps a little bit in answering the question. Good question. So you don't want to build your company until you've verified that this, the business model. And these are kind of just general tenants when you're thinking through growing your business at an early stage that you might want to consider. So this is sort of a 3D representation of what a business model canvas looks like. Um, as you can see, there's, there's nine components here that we'll go into just a little bit of detail about each one of these. Um, and there's sort of a, a method to the madness in terms of the construction of, of, the, of the canvas and how it's put together. 
If you'll notice sort of the value proposition of what you're offering is right there as the core central tenant of this, of this canvas. On the right hand side is all the ways in which you interact with sort of your customers and the customer de de discovery piece and where your revenue is going to derive from, from those customers. On the left hand side are all the work you have to do to put in to sort of de develop the value proposition further. So what are the activities you need to do, the resources or partners you need to employ, and then what's it going to cost you? There's going to be a cost to acquiring these customers and developing your product. What does that look like? And so again, these are not foreign concepts to you, I'm sure, and not things that you wouldn't necessarily have in a business plan, but you sort of see how they tend to interrelate and how this becomes kind of the central tenet of what you're trying to develop in that value proposition. So let's look at some of these nine components just a little bit more. So on the far hand, right hand side, you have the customer segment side. And these questions um, sound somewhat simplistic, but if you look at them, each of them are going to have, uh, the, there's a challenging aspect to each of them that you really are going to have to answer. So, you know, on the customer segment side, which, which customers and users are you really serving? You know, sometimes that can be actually a very hard question to, to answer. Um, which jobs do they really want to get done? Not which jobs do you think they want to get done, which jobs do they really want to get done? Oftentimes that might be in, a, in direct conflict with some of your assumptions about those customer segments. So each one of these, if you'll notice when we go through this, each one of these different components asks questions that really requires you to get the answers directly from the market you're serving, not just put your own assumptions forward uh, about what you're going to do. So we talked about the value proposition being in the center. What are you offering them? What is it that you're getting done for them? And more importantly, do they care? Um, you don't want to be a solution in search of a problem. You want to verify that the problem and the pain that you're solving is acute enough that you're actually fulfilling a need that the customers want. So this can be, this can be you know, somewhat challenging. You think you've got a perfectly good value proposition and you realize that's not what the customer wants at all. Channels. So again, we're operating on the right hand side here. So how does each customer segment want to be reached? Not how do you want to reach each customer segment, but how do they want to be reached? How do people want to receive the information about your product or service? And through what interaction points? How are you going to do it? Are you going to go over the web, direct to consumer? Are you going to use a third party to get to a market? Well, how are you going to do these things? And how do they want to be react to? Customer segments are going to be different um, for each of the different aspects of, of this, this building block. And the customer relationships. So what, what relationships are you establishing with each se segment? Is it personal? Is it automated? Can you scale this up? Does it really need to be hand-holding, um, retentive? All of these questions that you need to start asking about how you're going to interact with your customer base. The revenue streams. What are they really willing to pay for? Um, and how are they going to do that? Are you generating transactional or recurring revenues? Can you, re can, you, can you get recurring revenue from this customer or is it a one-time sale and you got to go find a new customer? Um, these are all things, you know, obviously impacting your bottom line. Simple questions, but ones that you really got to think through clearly. Your key activities. What do you need to do to perform well? What's actually crucial? What can you do at this stage early on? Or what do you need help with? This is an area that sometimes you might realize you don't have the wherewithal to actually do everything yourself. Therefore, you might need partners or suppliers to leverage your model. So who do you need to rely on? The more partners and the more suppliers you have, the further you get away from potentially getting to your customers. So, and the more you got to split revenues. So that becomes a challenging thing to think about as well. And then finally, your cost structure. So what is the resulting cost structure of this and what are the elements that really drive that cost? Really understanding that. Things like the cost to acquire a customer. Those kinds of things are questions that investors are going to ask that you have to think through. Cost not only in terms of just dollars and cents but time. You know, can you get a customer rather quickly or does it really take a consultative sales approach and can you do this over and over again to really develop a profitable business? Oops. 
Oh, and the key resources. Which resources underpin your business model? Which assets are essential? That's the last building block we want to mention. So that 3D interface is what turns into kind of this 2D piece of paper that you'll find actually in your packet that's blown up, and we'll, we'll reference that in just a second. But that's why it's sort of structured the way it is, and some of the questions, some of those questions that are on those slides are repeated within and on the business model that you have in front of you. So your task really, what we're asking you to do, um, and one of the deliverables of the program is really to sketch out your business model. And while that sounds somewhat daunting, here's, here's a great thing that might free you up when you think about doing this. They're all guesses anyways. <laughs> so, you know, you, there, in, in many respects, you know, there's not a wrong answer here until you're proven wrong by testing this model with a, with a customer segment. Or you figure out there's no way you can possibly test that. But to identify these things is important, to understand what is the work and the blocking and tackling you're going to actually have to do as an entrepreneur to go out and build this business that you're trying to create. So that means, question, yeah? Yeah, you have one in your packet. And what we're actually going to do, not to jump too far ahead, we've blown one up nicely. ML blew up one that's much bigger, so it's easier to read than an 8.5 by 11. And we're passing out some sticky notes. So the easiest way to do this is literally to make it to look like this. So you, you can reuse it multiple times. Because there's, you're probably not going to get it right the first time. So you want to you be able to do multiple ones of these. So using sticky notes and just writing, jotting down an answer for each section, stick it on the canvas, put the canvas on the wall, put it you know, in your office, stare at it, you know, obsess about it, think about it, and then rip it down, redo it, put more sticky notes, and, and do this over again. That's actually really the, the process that we want you to do. There are, there are plenty of online resources, so you can do digital versions of this yeah. as well. So, um, What's it called? Canvanizer.com, C-A-N-V-A-N-I-Z-E-R.com. Any other questions at this point? So obviously these are difficult questions you've got to ask yourself sometimes, you know? When you're trying to serve parallel models, can I do that? Can I get the, the answers I need? Do I need to look at uh, a physical source for my, my lo or location or can it be virtual? Um, direct or indirect sales, those ideas about partners and suppliers and addition, additional channel sales opportunities, or can I go direct to the consumer? All of these things, ask these questions, spend some time on it, but then come to, come to an answer, put it down on, the, on a piece of paper. Now, once you fill one of those out, you're not done. As I mentioned, you really need to validate your model assumptions with, ideally, customers, right? This is, uh, this is where you get out of the building. This is where you go do survey data, where you talk directly to a market you might want to look at serving and ask for some information back. Make sure that you're getting it right. Because when you get that feedback, chances are you're going to be ripping some stickies off different sections going, that's not going to work. They're not going to pay this much. They don't like to be sold directly. They've got a direct relationship with a, with a channel partner that I need to have a relationship with. So therefore, I've got to make a model on how I'm going to make a relationship with that channel partner. How do I figure all these things out? Um, what we lovingly call this is customer development. And if you look at this sort of it's meant to be a repetitive process that never gets done fully. You're going to continually be looking for this and getting that feedback so that when you go to spend the money to build, whether it's a prototype, whether it's a, a website, when you're actually investing time and money and resources into product development, you've got a pretty good idea of what a customer that you're going to serve is really looking for. We split this up generally into two halves. This side is search. This side is execution. If you do the search part first, and you do that well, you've got a pretty good understanding of what a customer wants. They're validating your model. They're validating that they will buy from you, that they like what you've developed. Then you get into things 
like customer creation company building. This is where you apply those marketing dollars and adding sales staff and really kind of ramping up operations and doing a lot of the company building because you know you have a goal and you know you have something you can go for and you know you have customers that you've helped develop and create through this process. So you're going to need to adapt it over and over again until you can prove it works. Multiple canvases, multiple opportunities to try this. It's okay to fail at this process. You really want to get it right. You really want to make sure you establish connections if you can and figure out how to do that. And that's not easy. I'm not, the, the out, getting out of the building and going and trying to find a customer, that's a hard part. That's when you're, when you're brand new, when you're a new startup, that's challenging. So how do you prove a business model? Well, one way is you complete a sale of a minimally viable product set or feature set, also called an MVP. So this works very, very prominently in the tech space where you can create just you know, a, a, a prototype, if you will. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles of what you're going to have in it, but it's got enough of a solution that you have an early pilot adopter, somebody that's early, early customer that's going to take this and they'll pay you for it. And you now know you've got something and you can figure out how do I get more customers like that. So let's look at a couple examples and I picked one on the tech side, one on the consumer product side. So Flickr, which many people have heard about, it's a bit dated, but I picked it for kind of that reason. So Flickr's a photo sharing, online photo sharing company, got really hot in the mid-2000s. They were kind of one of the first ones in this space, before cloud, before Instagram, before Facebook really took off. Uh, they took off, and they actually were acquired by Yahoo. It's an interesting one because Many people don't ever use Flickr anymore because everybody puts stuff on Instagram. So they actually, they had a model that really worked. They got acquired, which is awesome for a startup. But at the time, and at the time, Yahoo, who acquired them, looked like the right acquisition partner. They actually turned down Google and they turned down a couple other companies that, are, that you would know today uh, to get acquired. And in reality, it was a bad play and it was a bad bet. But at, at the time, they had a model that really worked for them. So let's look at what that looked like. So they were a premium photo sharing and had a free basic photo sharing. The value proposition was online sharing of your photos and images. They, uh, they had mass uh, customer appeal and then a customized version of what they, what they sold. They had casual users, so the casual photographer all the way up to high volume users, professional photographers. Um, and it was the revenue streams. Now revenue was also a way to get users. So they had free limited basic account to get more users on. And then they had an annual sub subscription for the pro account where you could do more things, more features and benefits. Their channels were through their own website. And then when Yahoo acquired them, they used Yahoo's marketing e engine to try to, to, try to get more, more customer base. Their key activities were managing their platform and selling the service, okay? Um, their key resources was, was their platform and their brand. Um, back then, before cloud, you had storage costs, so they had to worry about servers and, and putting stuff and having enough storage and, and being able to make it profitable there and developing their platform, paying their engineers and having their talent on staff. And they had a really good partner at the time in Yahoo. Okay? But when you go through this, even if you figure out one that works, you can still be waylaid by market forces that are beyond your control. So you kind of need to also do a SWOT analysis overall on this, on this model and, and figure out, you know, have I figured out the right... Sometimes when you pick a partner, you don't want to pick a partner that's going to sink you. And in this case, Yahoo was just ended up not being a good partner for Flickr. They, they still have some really cool technology. They still have some really interesting uh, applications, but they made some really bad missteps along the way because of that partner uh, affiliation, and they're just not who you think about when you think about online photo sharing today. One more example, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, product Gillette, pretty simple. Razors and razor blades, right? So pretty straightforward. They sell a razor handle and they sell blades. They get you, if you buy your, their, the razor handle, you got to buy their blades, right? And their blades wear out. So they have a mass market, mass customer appeal through the retail channel in various stores across the country and across the globe. There's a one-time handle purchase, so they get revenue off of that, and then they get purchase, 
multiple purchases off of the blades, recurring revenue over, over long, hopefully a long period of time with their customers from their perspective. So their key resources are their brand. They've got patents over some of the blade technologies that they have. Um, heavy marketing, R&D, and logistics. Um, they have manufacturers and retailers as their partners that they have to keep happy and that they have to work with. And then, of course, their cost structure right now, manufacturing, R&D, heavy marketing, lots of logistics to get, get, the, get the product where it needs to go. So these are kind of some simplified examples, but what I want to sort of emphasize with you guys is that you don't have to think, don't overthink this. You really want to put this down, but you want to figure out a model that works for you and your business and figure out, be thinking about as you put the stickies on each section, how am I going to go validate this? How am I going to go test this? Who do I know? Who can I talk to? Who can help me? And we can work through that in the different tracks and over the course of the next few weeks to give you some strategies specifically related to your business on how to do that, but know that that's a part of it. Slapping just a, a sticky down and having that sort of covered with, with you know, uh, something written down there isn't going to be enough. It's not enough to move the needle. It's definitely not enough to move the needle for an investor. And, and if you're looking to, to really gain momentum, you really got to show that, that out of the building traction with the users and the customers you're looking for. And that's going to be your task going forward. That's one of the deliverables at the end of the today. So that's everything that I had. You have uh, a canvas in there that hopefully could be reusable. We, we mentioned a couple online tools. I'll maybe send that link around to a couple people as well if you want to use that uh, online. What can I answer in terms of questions? What, what kind of questions do people have? Yep. Yeah. Give a suggestion as to, I mean, I could do this one time and have 15 stickies on each little section. Right. But it looks like you, you need to focus. Um, you're a startup and you're probably a one person band right now. So if you've got 15 stickies on each section, how are you going to accomplish all 15 of those things and validate that? <laughs> to me, that's, if you, you know, you can only take it sort of one step at a time like this. Keep it as narrowly defined as you possibly can. What, what can you do extremely well, and what is this business, how is it going to have a competitive advantage over someone else? I think that's going to be key. Yep. Good, this is, uh, Seems like Right. I think you want to think about if I'm going to run this as a full-time business and make it profitable and develop revenue, what model, taking into account all of those components, works the best to do that? Obviously, your first customer or the first sort of thing you're going to roll out, you're going to tweak and you're going to make changes to. That's how you do that feedback. It is meant to sort of change and evolve over time, but there ought to be a general flow to these nine components, how they work together. And you may not need all nine, but you might, you need to figure out how they all kind of work together in order to create that business that you can continue to develop revenue and be profitable over time. So think about where you want to grow this business. What kind of business are you, run, are you developing? Um, if you're looking to be acquired, if you're looking for an exit where somebody's going to buy you, you know, you have to ramp up your you know, make a blip. You have to develop your revenues and, and, and get traction with users fairly quickly and be able to scale to get to the point where you are going to be an acquisition target. If it's something where you're going to have just recurring revenues over time and it's a little bit more of a lifestyle based business, that'll change and de determine the model a little bit differently over time. Right. And as far as like the exit type of strategies and, and things like that, how do you, when we're posting these things up, what should we, what should we be thinking about as far as like the operational agreement between partners and the eventual exit strategy and then this business model validation at the beginning and then as it evolves? Yeah. So I think 
any assumption that you make on this, you want to go test that out. And that includes finding partners, finding team members, finding co-founders, co, uh, that sort of thing. You're going to want to test this with them and see if it makes sense. So if it's a channel partner, what are they going to require? What do they need from me to partner with me? What does it need to look like? In many cases, you might not have you know, the, the advantage of being, you know, you're going to be a small business. You're going to be the little guy trying to maybe partner with somebody big, but they're going to let you know what, what you need to look like in order to kind of do business with them. So let that guide some of your actions. If, that, if I understand your question correctly, I'm not, I'm not sure I do. I'm just, you know, I'm curious about the, the formation of an operational agreement. Yeah. And, and how that's going to be structured with, with the business model, the business canvas in mind. Do you mean an operating agreement between like team members on, on your team, like ownership, people that have ownership in the company? Yeah. Are these interrelated? Not exactly. I mean, that's your team dynamic. The people that you bring on, you're going to have to bring on based on what they can do to drive the overall business. My assumption in this is that they've all bought in. They'll be contributing members to creating a model that creates a profitable company, if that, if that makes sense. Or the resource. They're, they're the human capital you're going to, you know, as a resource that you're going to use to drive this model. So they, you need to figure out really, how do they fit into this? What part of this can they help, you know, validate these different components of that model? What, what are they going to do? And how it relates to the operating agreement is really more about what their role is going to be within that company and what kind of equity they're going to have and what kind of responsibilities they're going to have. Yeah? You talked about Steve Blank, uh, so I guess you're familiar with the There's a couple things. Um, some of them are uh, some for-profit models that are out there. So I, I you know, I, I haven't used a ton of them. So I don't, I don't tend to uh, try to say I've got a working knowledge of them or, or promote them per, too too much. There's a thing called Quick MVP, which uses things like you can set up a, a sort of a landing website, landing web page. Use Google AdWords to kind of market to the, to the audience that you're looking for. You make about a few hundred dollars spend on that or maybe a couple, you know, maybe up to a thousand and see if you can attract people to the idea, to the concept and see if that really takes off. And there's more to that uh, <laughs> along those lines. But I think nothing really replicates you going out and talking directly to your customers as much as possible. So figuring out if you can get to that first so first person research kind of thing is, is critical. So if you can do that, I think that's, that's almost better than any tool that's out there to tell you, you know, it can tell you certain things. It can tell you, I'm getting a lot of traffic. There seems to be a lot of interest. That can sort of encourage you and embolden you to go after maybe certain markets and tell you where to go. But I think nothing's gonna really replace you getting out of the building and going and visiting these people firsthand kind of thing. Yes? On Dun and Bradstreet. Yeah, they want money at the DMV numbers. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's that. That might be. Is Andrew still here? I don't know if he's still around. You do need them. Yeah. 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 I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to get one unless there was a reason and a rationale to have it. You know, at this stage, you know, I don't think it's as important. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's this is a, an area where you gotta. There's no. There's more of an art than a science to this. I mean, at some point, you're gonna need people on your team to be the marketing specialist, to be the, to be the people that understand how to get customers, that really understand that marketplace. So right now you're probably wearing all of those hats and trying to do all of those jobs. The best resource when you're in that stage is really to sort of expand your network circles as much as you can. Seek out credible mentorship from organizations that might have contacts in that space. Um, the mentors that, for, in particular at I-10, that we bring on board generally come with 
either they've done it before, they're serial entrepreneurs, so they've been in your shoes and they can give you credible advice on how to do that. They're investors, so they know what, how to raise money. They have domain expertise in areas that might be pertinent that you might not have. Or they have a really good contact list and people that they can put you in contact with and make a warm referral. So in those cases, you're looking for really help. If you can't find it internally and add it to the company directly, I would suggest the robust ecosystem that was mentioned tonight, there's probably somebody in that that knows someone that can help you make. And those warm handoffs, those referrals from trusted resources, they make a, they make a big difference, you know, as opposed to you trying to cold, cold call directly into those kinds of organizations. Anything else? Good questions. The last question is, you know, uh, I know the business model is done, but is there any other software that is competitor of the business model is done? Yeah, so, I mean, there's uh, versions of the Canvas that, that will emphasize different sections. They'll break down maybe the value proposition in, in a different way, um, generally based on some industry-specific reasons why they do that. Um, so there's one that's much more aligned to web and software kind of based, although this works pretty well for that. Um, the one area, and I might refer maybe to Harry on this, you know, the biosciences tend to, tend to develop in a slightly different way. You're, you're not going to have an MVP for a, you know, pharmaceutical product or a med device. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to rely on sort of the market base and the knowledge that's there and the larger players in that space. But Right. It's going to oversee you. And so they're going to spell out uh, the minimum requirements for product development. And, you know, that's, that's a constraint that in a way makes this exercise easier, <laughs> but it makes real life a lot harder and more expensive, right? So, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You know, if you're developing a drug, you're going to take it through three phases of clinical trials. Phase one, so in healthy volunteers, phase two, and in people that are sick, but not large enough to be statistically significant. And then phase three, your pivotal trial, right? You know you're going to go through those steps. So in a way, product development is easier, although it's hellishly expensive for pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, anybody here working on a pharmaceutical? OK, let's talk after the slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so those regulatory agencies act as a surrogate for the customer, but there are no substitute for having direct customer contact. So ultimately, you know, whoever's going to make the buying decision is your customer, and you need to get in front of that person, and I think this has been said again and again, there's no substitute. So for example, when we were developing drugs at, at, at Searle and Merck, where I work, we would certainly know what the regulatory agency was going to require, we know how our drug was going to perform, and we knew from experts what it would do, but, you know, how to formulate it into a tablet, what color the tablet should be, how often it should be dosed. Uh, you know, what kind of warnings to put on the label, what kind of, what kind of patients, what management of patients we're reaching out to. Those are all things that we would get directly from the decision maker, from a doctor in the form of marketing research. So, you know, this direct contact with the customer is key in all businesses, even heavily regulated. And so just maybe tie that back to Roger, you had a question about kind of operating agreements and how that, how that works. That means, you know, it may mean that your role as the founder of this company changes over time. And you're, you're really sort of abdicating some control over certain aspects of the business to somebody that comes in that really already has that background, already has maybe deep customer relationships in the market you're trying to serve. So they become, you know, a mu much more front-facing person in the company and you maybe take, you know, a more backseat role to it. Um, you know, in the biosciences, a lot of times, you'll, that's why you'll see EIRs come into companies where they're taking bench stage research, but that EIR has spent, you know, 20 years in the pharma industry and has a whole host of contacts and knows exactly what to develop and how to commercialize and what's needed to do that. So the founders of the company, they're probably not going to have that forward-facing CEO role. They may fade back into the CTO role or CIO or some, some, other, some other perspective on what it is that you're doing within the company. So, you know, that flexibility in your operating agreement and who does what and who emphasizes as you're bringing new team members in, 
does kind of play into kind of how do you get in front of customers, how do you make sure you're validating your, your model. Excellent. Well, guys, I'll be around the whole class, so thanks so much. Appreciate your time.